that you can see on this map. And this is significantly shorter than what uh, the blue line shows. So it's almost 40% of the journey. And since these ships consume diesel, which is a fossil fuel, then one way of looking at it would be that the consumption uh, of diesel would be much lower and therefore this is good for climate change. The only reason why this slide is being, or this construct is being shared right in the beginning of this presentation is for us to understand that sometimes there is this dichotomy between uh, the short term and the long term. The very fact that the ship could go through the Northern Sea route through the Arctic Circle, very close uh, uh, to the North Pole, and enter Rotterdam from the northern route means that the ice would have melted enough for the route to open up. Now, what does it mean for the ice to uh, melt and the route to open up? It means that there's something happening on this planet which is creating this change. And while on the short term, it might be good news for the shipping industry and overall fossil fuel consumption, but from another perspective or another lens, uh, it means that climate change is here and now, and uh, there are serious uh, ramifications of that. Uh, if you look at the blue circle 1970 and down to between 2007 and 2030, you can see how the Arctic ice has melted over a period of time and the, the, the projection is by the year 2100, there'll just be a little cap of ice uh, on the northern side of Greenland. The whole ocean, the Arctic Ocean, would be bereft of ice. I had the good fortune of going to both the Arctic and the Antarctic because often as a photographer, as someone who's trying to understand uh, the changes that are happening in the climate or the planet, uh, I thought it was important for me to experience all this firsthand. This is Longyear Bian uh, on uh, Svalbard Island, very close to the Arctic Circle. And it has no business to have green grass growing there. Uh, the fact that uh, the grass is growing there, that means things are warming up. And um, also I visited the Global Seed Vault which is a place where seeds, it's like the Noah's Ark of all the seeds of all the crops from all over the planet, like Indian rice varieties, wheat, millets, everything is stored here, cataloged beautifully, so that if there is some cataclysm, if there is some impact on planet Earth, we don't have to start from grasses again to produce grains. And the reason this was located in on Svalbard Island near the Arctic or inside the Arctic Circle is because uh, it's so cold here that you don't need to spend uh, you know, huge amounts of money to have thousands and thousands of tons of uh, uh, air conditioning. Uh, so naturally, it will just keep the seeds cool so that they don't germinate and they stay in that inert stage. But in 2015, the global seed vault was flooded because of an, a melt around it. Luckily, not much damage took, took place because most of the seeds were placed in uh, in storage systems that were taller than the, uh, I mean, higher than the floor. This is all just to let you know what all is happening on this planet. And huge amounts of uh, ice crashing down, uh, icebergs falling at a frequency and intensity that was never seen before. Uh, in the Antarctic, uh, you know, as a photographer, I had to kneel down to take images of uh, this um, bird, which is actually the, it's it's a, just a minute. It's the chin strap, chin strap penguin. And uh, while it's, a, it's an iconic species to be seen in the Antarctic, but actually it is a climate change loser uh, because, uh, you know, because of the climate change, the populations are declining. Uh, and if uh, the krill, which is the main feed for uh, for the birds, 
disappears because of the sea ice melting, then they don't have enough food. And if by any chance the chicks die because of rain, because when they're born, their, their feathers are not waterproof, then they are unlikely to lay eggs again that year. So you have um, huge colonies of penguins and you can see those furry balls, brownish, darkish colored, grayish brown colored. These are the young chicks that are born. It's not supposed to rain in the Antarctic, but if it rains, all these chicks will die. So obviously, uh, and then of course, there is the seal, which is the main food for the polar bear. In the, I'm going back to the Arctic now, uh, oscillating between the Arctic and the Antarctic, which are actually the reason I'm saying all this is because these are indicators of, uh, of uh, what's happening to the climate of this planet. Uh, this is the food for polar bears. Polar bears would smell the bearded seal and quietly come from the other side, from behind and creep upon it and then jump and uh, kill it and eat it. But because there's less and less of floating ice, the chances of a polar bear to catch a seal, which is the main food, is getting lower and lower. So that the polar bear is being threatened. Actually, the polar bear is the finest symbol of climate change, uh, you know, and I always had a dream to take a photograph of a polar bear sitting on a little piece of ice uh, and hopefully looking into the camera rather than borrowing an image from the internet for that, because uh, that would really be a powerful story of where we are going. Uh, some of you all must be thinking, what is all this to do with biodiversity conservation in the corporate world? But I think this is a context, uh, and very soon we are going to move into chapters where it will all tie up together. So just bear with me on that. Um, so the question, and, and these are the landscapes we saw, hardly any ice in the Arctic. Um, um, I had done this trip just before the pandemic. <clears throat> and... Um, so I asked myself, will I get to see a polar bear in the wild, having traveled all the way from India into the Arctic Circle? And of course, the more meaningful question is, does it make any sense in a, a FICI uh, awareness module on biodiversity to talk about whether I'll see the polar bear in the wild? Uh, but everything has a strong connectedness. Uh, between biodiversity, between nature, between human civilization. And this amazingly complex connectivity is something that sometimes uh, can be said to be fragile. And if it breaks, uh, then we would be doing or making a huge impact on the balance of the planet. So therefore, if a if a polar bear goes extinct or some pe penguins go extinct, uh, does it mean anything? Because the question could come from somebody that they, you know, animals always, I mean, over a period of time, there are so many animals that are gone extinct. So what's the big deal about it? But hopefully by the end of this presentation, the case would be made for it. And uh, these species are also indicators of the health of the planet. And so therefore, uh, it is important for us to have a look at that from that perspective. <clears throat> now, there is no um, need to provide more evidence of the impact of climate change. And as we speak, I believe Delhi recorded uh, a temperature more than 50 degrees, uh, was it yesterday or today? Uh, amazingly, the picture on the bottom left uh, is of Dubai, and everyone would have seen what has happened in that part of the world, especially over the last 15 or 18 months. So, um, in a way, climate change impact is unfolding before us at a pace which, if we were to stop our daily grind and just reflect, we would understand what all is happening, whether it's forest fires in Australia or whether it's forest fires in, in California or whether they are droughts or droughts and floods in the same calendar year. 
and huge, huge amount of other impact of climate change. Uh, it's all there for us all to see it. And uh, while climate change from a perspective of human consumption is something that all of us need to be worried about, uh, there are many other things that are happening. But I think the, the let's say the dual impact of um, climate change on one side and degradation of the environment on the other, that's, that's a heady mix. Uh, if you were to look at the main significant players who could positively impact the issue of environment degradation as well as climate change, the two biggest players would be the government and the and business. And uh, this presentation is going to look at if we are drivers of transformation sitting in business, what is it that we can do about it? But most importantly, is there a case for it or not? Uh, the corporate world understands two things better than anything else. One is the construct of risk and the other one is the construct of opportunity. So when someone does environment conservation, one could do it from the perspective of, oh, it's a nice thing to do. My heart feels good about it. Gives me a warm feeling in my belly. That's all fine. But also, and more importantly, the corporate world looks at it both from the, the uh, perspective of, um, of risk and opportunity. Today, you can buy a satellite image of a pass over your project site, which might have um, taken place before you started your project. Uh, so the image, the green images on the top uh, is, a, is a satellite image showing mangroves all the green stuff is mangroves. And what you see on the right-hand side is a recent satellite image. Uh, obviously, I'm masking uh, where it is from. That's not important. But what's important is today we have the technology that you can say. While on paper, you can say, oh, we haven't impacted the mangroves at all. Satellite imagery shows what kind of impact an organization could have done. And then you have right to information. You got public hearings. There's a whole amount of information which is coming from technology and it's also coming from, uh, let's call it declarations, which actually makes a case for uh, looking at biodiversity conservation from the perspective of the impact it may have on the license to operate for organizations. I'm going to skip a couple of slides uh, for the sake of focusing more on the others, but very quickly, some of the key factors that are happening today all around us is natural resources are coming under pressure over, over exploitation and nothing can be more important here than the issue of water. Now, water by itself is not a living entity, uh, whether it can be called biodiversity or not, technically, obviously not, but Water is the most important element on which entire life on this planet, uh, say, uh, is dependent upon. So therefore, the over-exploitation of water is a big challenge. And then again, the here and now versus the long-term vision. How do organizations look at sustainable um, running of businesses is becoming an important issue. Uh, various corporate entities might be riding the wave of industrial growth without looking into the longer term impact of bio biodiversity on biodiversity. And the key issue now that is coming up and it's going to become legislation soon is cumulative impact. And it's important for a lot of, I when I went through the list of uh, people who signed up for this, a lot of people are from the uh, environment management teams and from uh, biodiversity teams. So today, if I were an industry that is putting in, say, 100 liters of water into a stream that then joins the river, and um, I might get a license to do that. But surrounding my plant, there might be 35 others. 
and all of them are putting in their quote unquote contribution of an effluent into the stream. So the cumulative impact, how much is the total impact? Mine might be 100 liters coming in right in the end because my plant started yesterday. But what is the cumulative impact onto the natural system, onto the quality of water, onto the, um, uh, the flora and fauna that is uh, serviced by that water? Uh, so as a construct, cumulative impact is becoming very important. So therefore, conservation needs to be looked at again from a different lens. And if you were to run a plant and tomorrow you want to make it better because the norms are getting stricter, everyone knows that retrofitting always costs more than building it in, in by design. So therefore, it's very important for people to take the longer term calls for it. Although the counterpoint of that is if your competitor doesn't do it, the competitor gets an advantage in the market. He can sell uh, the product at a lower cost. But eventually, responsible businesses are also the ones that run their business responsibly and also advocate for the entire industry and the entire nation to move towards a lower footprint for the goods and services that we create for society. And I think that's very important. Last point might seem a little soft, but you know, uh, good people like to work for good organizations. That would be just a very simple way of putting the last bullet. Uh, and I know so many people who are my friends and, and acquaintances who will not change their jobs. They would want to work for companies no matter what is the offer coming from another company that might seem less responsible. It is a soft point, but it's a, it's a, it's a real point. Um, if we were to look at, oops. A lot of mega trends that are happening in India and in the world, they are all going to impact our decisions. One point that I want to pull out is probably the third point on the left. Everyone knows the CSR law now that 2% of the average net profit of companies uh, over the last three financial years needs to be put in into your CSR fund for spend. Uh, so whatever is the kitty, only between 9 to 11% of it is actually moving in for environment conservation uh, purposes and a lot of it would be going in for green belts etc uh, not for some more mature biodiversity conservation initiatives and the bulk of it almost about 90 percent goes in for uh, what can be called community development or uh, social development now it's arguable somebody might say that you know uh, hunger, dealing with hunger and dealing with education and health may be more important than dealing with biodiversity uh, conservation. But as I said, there is an interlinkage uh, between the two and therefore we need to look at it uh, from uh, the perspective of maybe we need to balance this out a little more. Corporates need to spend a little bit more money on biodiversity conservation. Um, uh, and uh, of course, uh, trees and animals and birds do not have a strong voice. Uh, and all of us need to be their representatives uh, when we move towards a planet that is uh, more balanced in terms of biodiversity. Um, just going to quickly go through the the ESG construct here, but not to spend too much time because that's a, a subject by itself. But the planet has a carrying capacity and a desire for unlimited economic growth in a closed system is a problem which leads to overconsumption. And the impact of overconsumption is climate change, environmental degradation, bio biodiversity loss, uh, deprivation in society. And when the scale and impact goes up, we all need to you know, sit up and take notice of it. And that's where the whole construct of sustainable development comes in. 
And while there are many, many ways of looking at sustainable development, but one important uh, way of looking at it would be uh, to look at it from, um, say, uh, the triple bottom line, although today we are looking at it more from an ESG perspective. But I just want to focus on the first blue box on the left, which again, I'm repeating, is about climate change mitigation, climate change resilience, which is different from mitigation. Mitigation is what do you do to bring the entire carbon footprint of this planet or carbon emissions down of this planet. Today, we need to look more from a resilience perspective. For example, if there are going to be storm surges, if there's going to be climate actions, huge uh, climatic events happening there, then maybe you need to look at mangrove plantation as not just a plantation that is greening, Mangroves also capture carbon, so it is leading to ca ca climate change mitigation. And from a climate change resilience, uh, resilience perspective, you can look at mangroves as a bio shield, uh, where you know if you have storm surges, if a coastline has mangroves, then the impact to the hinterland is reduced. So you look at carbon sinks, water management, impact on biodiversity, and so many other things. And how do you report on it? How do you tell the um, uh, civil society, society at large about your performance? That's responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to skip to the next slide here. So, uh, so if you look at ESG as a dimension, environmental, social, and governance issues, today, Business partners want to do business with organizations that have a good track record of ESGs. Now, this can be looked at. We talked about the risk dimension. Now we are looking at the opportunity dimension. Tomorrow, if an organization wants to partner with a respectable international or a national organization, uh, then uh, your ESG um, reporting, your ESG performance, your performance on ESG becomes like a kundli, it's it's talking about how good you are on, on environment conservation, on the social dimension and your governance dimension. And uh, whether we are on the board or we are anywhere else, that's something that we need to look at. Uh, eventually, uh, we also need to look at, if you were to look at concentric circles, everything, whether you're a business or a institution or, uh, you know, a tribal um, small little shop selling tribal uh, products. All of us come under the largest concentric circle of environment. And a subset of that is the market where our stakeholders are customers. And then you might have a factory and therefore you have a neighborhood, which is the where the stakeholders, the community. And therefore your performance of how you run your operations is going to impact the community. And then, of course, you have the enterprise where the stakeholders are your employees. So the, the outermost circle, which is the environment, where your stakeholder is not just society at large, but also the future generations and the voiceless and all animals and plants are, are uh, something that encompasses everything else. And that should be the focus area. I'm going to skip this one here and move into um, so <clears throat> uh, i'm i'm just going to skip some of these slides because uh, i just feel that we lost a little bit of time and uh, so we might want to move into uh, the biodiversity part straight away i think this is the most important slide and I want to spend some time here. And this is something that the leadership of organizations, the operations people, the general managers, the, 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 the people running biodiversity, everybody needs to look at it. Now, supposing the horizontal line was before an organization did anything. This is the word natural value that's written on the left could very well be um, substituted for biodiversity. So before we came in, there was no net loss, it was zero. So that horizontal line is 
no net loss. Now you plan a project. And so there is a predicted impact, which is P1. That means you knocked off so many trees, you blocked one stream, um, you know, uh, you could have, uh, you know, uh, stopped some other natural drainages. Um, there were some nesting birds there. You impacted a lot of it. Now, <clears throat> this is a construct which I have put together. It's not as if that's some rocket science that I created, but just by understanding what's happening, I call this model the Amroa model, and I'll tell you why. So I can first look at what can I avoid? So that is the A of Amroa. I can avoid if I build my plant in such a way that some of its elements can be adjusted on the site plan so that I chop off less trees, um, then I've avoided some of the impact. So now the impact has become less. So whatever you saw in the first column on the left was the overall impact. I've avoided some impact and so on the khaki or the uh, brownish gray color has become less. And so therefore that A is in Amroa, the A is avoidance. And then I can also look at minimization. Minimization needs to look at things from a different perspective. Avoidance could be like if I'm building a house, I said, do I really need a swimming pool? <clears throat> how many um, days a month or uh, how many days a year am I going to use it? 20 days? Is it really worth it? I can afford the cost of a swimming pool. Can my nation afford the cost of the water which I'll pump out? That's avoidance. avoidance. Then it's minimization. I can say, okay, if I make my site plan like this, I'll chop off less number of trees. So that's, uh, I am minimizing it. Or I, you know, big projects need a lay down area where all your material is put there. Your steel guys are bending the bars there. Your uh, material is laid down cement and grit and uh, sand, etc. Can I work on an innovative way of lowering my footprint? I'll require less amount of land to acquire. I'll do it in a more, uh, uh, let's say, a smarter way so that I need less land. That would be minimization. These are, by the way, examples that are coming to mind now. You can extrapolate and bring in your own examples from your own realities. Hmm. So now you can see that the khaki has become even less. And then you need to look at AMR, that's restoration or rehab. Okay, after doing all the jugglery, um, 20 trees are going to get uprooted because I have to fit my layout. Can I restore them? So I carefully remove those trees and I try and restore it. And therefore, now the residual impact, residual impact is that little stuff. Look at where we started from and look at where we've reached. Now, the point is that when you restore, if I knocked off 20 trees, no one's stopping us from planting 40 trees. And therefore, that is where you could offset it by even planting outside your property or your project site. And you and no, nothing stops you from planting more. And the moment you plant more, then you might get into the positive. And finally, you might also try and do something for the overall environment. Maybe, you know, you are building a project site near a river and there are some otters there. And therefore, you do a project where the otters are being conserved, but they are not getting impacted by your project. You're doing an additional conservation action, which is not at all linked to your operations. And therefore, uh, you um, that's a good thing to do. Like I could be 200 kilometers away from a tiger sanctuary and I might be uh, saying as a corporate entity, let me see what I can do along with some governmental and non-governmental uh, organizations for the conservation of the tiger, maybe what, what can we do in terms of activities in the buffer zone that, uh, that uh, reduce uh, human-animal conflict, et cetera, et cetera. However, it's a very sensitive comment I'm going to make now, but it's an important comment. 
Sometimes organizations do this part, which is the ACA or the additional conservation action, but don't do enough to minimize, to avoid, to restore, and to offset the impact of their operations. So they are doing some nice project for the conservation of the tiger, but their pipes spewing effluents and destroying the the aquatic biodiversity nearby is not being addressed. And uh, society at large calls that greenwashing. And sometimes corporate entities are accused of greenwashing. That they, they, what, what they're trying to say is that you're involving yourself with some kind of a biodiversity conservation program, but you're not cleaning up your act. So this AMROA, standing for avoid, minimize, restore, offset and additional conservation action is actually sequential uh, or not necessarily sequential, but it's concurrent. You have to do everything. You can't just cherry pick and do one because eventually uh, your performance on biodiversity conservation is going to be measured on the impact getting minimized. How close are you going to come to the stage where that line was before your project started. <clears throat> so this, I think, is an important uh, construct. Um, I'm going to um, pause here and maybe uh, speak, um, although I don't have a slide for that, but I think it's an important thing. It's an important point I'm trying to make here, which is that, um, you know, Biodiversity as a construct has two words, right? It's biological diversity. So the second part, which is the diversity, uh, needs to be understood by all of us. So for example, if there were trees in a project site and there was a tree A, which was very rare, and it's also rare in the surrounding areas, <clears throat> they hardly three, four, and there's a tree B, which is 7, 8, tree C, that is, uh, you know, 15, 20. And there's a tree X, Y, and Z, which are in hundreds and thousands. So often what happens is when you clear a site, then the A, B, and C is almost disappear. And the X, Y, Z, which are already in a large number, their number goes down a little bit, but not significantly impacted. But when we do afforestation or reforestation, sometimes what biodiversity uh, people involved in, in let's call, say, say, let's just call it the horticulture department of, a, of an organization, what they do is they find out what is the tree that's available in the nurseries or what is the tree that has the least mortality and they might pick up, say, a casuarina or some tree and plant that. And so they'll fill the land with, or they'll green the land with trees, which uh, is a forestation, but it's not restoration. It's not biodiversity conservation. So keep in mind that if you're going to be reforesting an area, look at it from an expertise perspective that can I just find out what is it that will actually make a difference and, and try and bring in a certain balance back. Otherwise, uh, somebody might say, look, a tree is a tree. What difference does it make? It's going to sequester some carbon. It's going to provide shade. But biodiversity is a complex thing. The moment you reduce that biodiversity, you reduce the diversity in the forest, you'll suddenly find that the forest sometimes moves towards becoming a sterile forest. It'll have less um, microorganisms in the soil that will keep it rich. It'll have less insects, it'll have less birds, it'll have less animals there because it's become like a future forest or some kind of a monoculture plantation. So I think these are the things that we need to uh, keep in mind. Uh, I'm going to skip this part and just straight away. Uh, the other point that is very important to bring in 
is that uh, if you're going to do a biodiversity project, and this is also true for CSR, ideally it's done through partnerships. You might bring in uh, the forest department, which is uh, representing the government. You can bring in some conservation NGOs. You are the blue business there. You can bring in the local people who might get some kind of a, a livelihood out of the plantation of trees. Each one brings in something to the to the kitty and you're doing a project that then becomes more successful and more sustainable. Uh, in the end of it, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to sort of move towards the last section and then we can open it up for some Q&A. Uh, the, you know, um, while we, it's arguable that, uh, you know, what is the most dangerous animal on this planet? Uh, but actually, um, the truth is that with the technology that's available with us, with the resources that are available with us, with the ability to quickly create large-scale impact, uh, we are unarguably the most dangerous animal in the world. But on a more positive note, I would also like to say, from that same perspective of resources, <clears throat> from the same perspective of technology being available to us, we could also be that one animal that creates the maximum positive advantage of creating a positive future for this planet, which currently is in a precarious situation. Uh, sometimes one wonders how much of an education uh, is required for making people understand this connectedness between biodiversity and us. Uh, you know, a Varley painting which shows that beautiful connect between community, people, and the environment sometimes tells us that they understand it better than many of us with all our bright education. <clears throat> a chief Seattle, he's also an Adivasi in a way, but of uh, North America, made a very powerful statement. Uh, and this is part of his speech, which you all can uh, go to the internet and read. It's a large document. But one of his uh, most powerful lines was, the earth does not belong to man. And obviously in today's world, we will change that man to humankind to be more gender inclusive. Humankind belongs to earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Humankind did not weave the web of life. He's merely a strand in it. Whatever he or she does to the web, he or she does to himself and herself. So this is about the interconnectedness. If today um, people are suffering from breathing or lung-related dis diseases, bronchial diseases and other diseases in the NCR region of the country, um, it is because maybe we did not look at the whole issue of the impact of various industries. Today, even agriculture is an industry, uh, various industries uh, on the environment. And it doesn't blow away with just one gust of wind. It stays there. And therefore, there, we have that human impact. The other point is that <clears throat> we must keep in mind also that sometimes as society, we, um, we have a knee-jerk reaction to some, some, some change that takes place. Like, I don't know how many of you all recall that a few years back when the air quality index really went bad in the NCR, uh, the, um, uh, the authority, uh, they banned the sale of diesel vehicles. Uh, so there were some Indian companies uh, that mainly in their portfolio, they had diesel SUVs, etc. Overnight, their vehicles were sitting in showrooms and uh, they didn't get sold. So that's a longer term impact of an action that we are we are allowing to happen and and taking probably the softer approach to it and not really solving that issue. Uh, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, but the whole issue is that if we are sensitive to the impact and understand 
impact and assess impact unbiasedly, then mitigating impact is possible. Sometimes not at a low cost, but then ultimately what is the final cost that we as a civilization pay for our actions? And that's the key question. David Suzuki, I had the good fortune of meeting him a couple of times when I was a naturalist in Canada and a great thought, thought leader. He makes a slightly more um, political point in a way, but political in the sense about uh, as society, uh, what should be our model. He says there are some things in the world we can't change. Gravity, entropy, the speed of light and our biological nature that requires clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean energy and biodiversity for our health and well-being. Protecting the biosphere should be our highest priority or else we sicken and die. Other things like capitalism, free enterprise, the economy, currency, market are not forces of nature. We invented them. They are not immutable and we can change them. It makes no sense to elevate economics above the bias. Well. Now this sounds like a lot of gyan <clears throat> and some holier-than-thou statement. But I dare say that in the last couple of years, when we are seeing so many events happening on this planet, maybe we need to look at things like management of waste, uh, management of water, management of uh, impact on biodiversity and so many other things from the perspective of the long-term interest of humankind. Uh, somebody might ask, yeah, but... Um, in a nutshell, what is it about biodiversity that uh, we really need to understand? Why is it so important? So obviously all our food comes from biodiversity. There's so many new grains and foods that are coming into our table today uh, that a few years back were not there. So we are introducing, they're coming from some kind of a, uh, let's call it the granary of nature. I remember when I did the Kailash Mansarovar Yatra uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, when we crossed the border into China, we had to give a quote-unquote bribe to the uh, people from the other side uh, who were to escort us. And you know what the bribe was? The bribe was a flower which is found on the alpine slopes very close to um, Lipu Lake Pass, which is what you cross when you go into. And that flower is called Heem Kamal. And it's got hairy petals. It's white, fluffy, hairy petals. And when I asked the Chinese counterpart that why do you want it? He says it doesn't grow on our side. It's all a desert on this side. But why do you want it? And he said if you get a cut and you just place one petal there, it immediately coagulates blood. So you don't bleed till you can get some help. And So there are so many, so many uses of biodiversity which we haven't even found till today. All our medicines come from biodiversity. Our inspiration of art comes from biodiversity. We are learning biomimicry is part of biodiversity. Helicopters are inspired from dragonflies. The flippers that uh, divers and snorkelers use is inspired from the whale's fin. Velcro, which is used to strap things, has been inspired from the burrs that you get on your socks when you walk through the undergrowth, you know, those dried um, sort of thorny things. And I can go on and on and on. Uh, so there is so much of biomimicry uh, that today we are utilizing for development of products that we need. The food comes from there. Our clothing comes from there. So it biodiversity is something that because of its interconnectedness uh, uh, nature, we might not know the impact of what we are doing. All we must know is that if we are causing a depletion of biodiversity, what is the best way while running our plants, while running our operations, while conducting our supply chain, while creating new projects, while selecting sites for our new projects, everywhere else, 
are we asking the right questions on biodiversity conservation? Uh, finally, um, I'm going to end this slide show by uh, just two pictures. Uh, so again, this is back to where I started from, the Arctic. And uh, I had asked myself, will I get to see the polar bear before it's too late, both for me and the polar bear? I'm not getting any younger. And the poor polar bear's future is not guaranteed. And uh, on that 15-day expedition on the ship in the Arctic waters, every day my stress level was going up. And I was asking, will I see one or not? Will I get the shot that I want? Eventually, I did get the shot that I wanted. Polar bear almost looking straight. However, I want to leave a very sobering thought that the expeditionist who was with us said, that by now this polar bear should have been fat and chubby, having stored enough fat to last him for the winter. This is a hungry polar bear and let's all hope that he finds a prey soon so that he can survive the winter. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm open to any questions. I would request if someone goes through the questions because I don't have that on my screen. Technically, I still have a little bit of a issue, uh, so I'll be happy. Hi. So, Mr. Dinwad, there are some questions in the QA. I'll read out them to you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, Shabdendu Patak, uh, he is asking how to establish baseline when you are a hundred years old company and have no historical data, uh, which you are to consider for baseline. Yeah. Now, that's a complex question. I think it's okay. We tried to do a similar thing for a 100-year-old company. I was a part of a 100-year-old company, and we did we did uh, uh, do this exercise. I think it's important to understand that integrity and accuracy are two different things. As long as you have integrity, and you're doing it not to get some false number there, even if your accuracy is low, it's okay. Your heart should be in the right place. You can use a lot of assumptions. For example, if I'm part of a hydropower company and the dam was built 100 years ago, before that dam, there was biodiversity. There were trees there in that valley and there was wildflowers and and so many other things. But now all that is under 30 feet of water. Now, how do I know what was that number in terms of diversity? Uh, there was no register at that time. So um, how do I establish it? So you can establish a, through an assumption, a ballpark number, and then look at how are you managing it. It could be by looking at an adjacent valley which has similar features. Now, you'll be off by a certain percentage. I don't even know what that percentage is, but it really doesn't matter. Even if you take today's baseline and say, okay, fine, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy about what it was in the past. Let's talk about from today onwards, what am I doing? That's good enough. But if you were to do the, the stuff that I'm talking about, which is, trying to extrapolate through assumptions, through looking at equivalent or seemingly equivalent landscapes. That's another way of doing it. Uh, another question now uh, goes uh, that lot, there's lot, lots of interest on green credits scheme. How will it change uh, CR, CSR spends uh, is what someone has posted. Lots of interest on green credit schemes, and he wants to know how will it change CSR spends. Yeah, so um, I'm going to very carefully answer that <clears throat> uh, by giving you a small little example. Um, there is an amazing Tata company, um, uh, and it has a great history on CSR, etc. And they started a football academy. Some of y'all would be guess, would would know which company I'm talking about. And they set up an amazing football academy, 
and uh, uh, they wanted to build talent so that India becomes uh, a good force in international football. So the leader of that company, a great man, was asked uh, by the media one day when the football academy was launched that what is the tax benefit that your the government is going to give you for setting up this football academy? And he said, that's the wrong question. We are not doing it for a tax benefit. We are doing it because it's the right thing to do. If we do get tax benefits, then that's a bonus. But we don't do it for that. And that is the whole thing about CSR. I've been on so many CSR panels where a lot of questions come. Can I show this expenditure as CSR? And I say, okay, first of all, <laughs> I'm hesitating to respond to you, but what is that expenditure you're talking about? And they'll talk about some R&D, which doesn't seem to be doing much on corporate social responsibility. It might be something to do with pure business development. So if you're going to be looking at the advantages of things that are the right thing to do, then uh, that might be the wrong starting point. However, if you do get it, it's a good thing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, talk about carbon credits. And today there is a strong voice that says that eventually you must look at minimizing your carbon footprint and not looking for avenues to get some offset happening somewhere else. And so therefore, if we want this planet to actually become better than what it is today, all of us should be on that Amroa journey. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, how do we become a low footprint enterprise? And that is most important. The financial benefits are something that parts of the organization would be interested in, and that's their job. It's good if it happens, but that should not be the driving force for environment conservation. Uh, uh, Kanchan Jagtab is asking uh, which biodiversity conservation projects can be done for cement manufacturing companies? So I think it will depend upon the geography that you are located in. It, it's, it cannot be generic uh, for different industries. If you are a cement plant in Madhya Pradesh, uh, in a, or in an arid zone in Rajasthan or in Kutch, or if you're in a place close to, hopefully not, but close to a tiger reserve, then the answer would be totally different. The way to understand biodiversity conservation is to try and create a register of what exists today and how your existence there can minimize uh, the diversity that exists. So that is the way to do it. Uh, then there are some generic ways. For example, if you were to set, and I'm just going to give you one or two examples which I'm familiar with. Uh, but like, for example, if you were to set up a huge solar farm somewhere with all these panels, uh, usually what happens is that, you know, uh, they just, remove all the grasses there because grass is a fire hazard which is fine but if you were to train your people who manage the whole uh, estate or the farm by saying that look these are the local uh, wild shrubs and plants that don't grow too high so they're not a forest hazard a fire hazard so therefore if you were to uh, just make sure that you ring fence these from getting knocked off by your clear cutting, uh, then uh, that way I can look at uh, conserving some of the biodiversity with at no risk to my operations. So I think it is the answer will come from understanding your landscape, understanding what exists there and then taking action.
Um, Anshu from HDFC Capital is asking, uh, should the cost for restoration rehabilitation uh, come from CSR budget or should we uh, should that be part of the project expenses? I, I, so I don't know how to answer that question. If I were the chief sustainability officer, I would ask the project to absorb the cost. The projects, when they come up, they have huge budgets. This will be minuscule compared. I mean, it will be like not too much coming out of that kitty. So, um, so it'll be it'll be easier to do that. Your CSR kitty is limited. You can use it for things that can't easily come in from your uh, uh, project budget. So that's the way I would look at it. So I think I've covered most of the questions or in the Q&A. It's a long one. I'm just reading out whether it's a question or a comment. Uh, nowadays, businesses are only concerned about complying with statutory regulations and enhancing their chances to exist. Um, there are many loopholes. Uh, uh, in such a scenario, how should a gov government improvise or what measures uh, should it take in your opinion so that the actual purpose remains intact? It's actually so, very... Very beautiful question, but I want to answer it slightly obliquely. Um, you see, if you were to look, uh, am I visible on the screen? I have stopped your sharing. So yeah, you uh, okay. can see. That's me. fine. So if you were to look at a vertical axis, uh, and that axis is about performance on conservation, biodiversity conservation. And the horizontal axis could be maybe time. And if I were to draw three curves, the lowest curve, the second and the third, the lowest curve is compliance. And the other two are beyond compliance. <clears throat> the lowest curve is you comply because if you don't comply, then your license to operation uh, to operate is taken away. You have to do it unless you are a cheating enterprise, which none of us would want to be in that category. In the second one, it is compete. You're competing with better standards of biodiversity conservation. You're bringing in some best practices. You want to have picked up something that another cement plant has done, which is beautiful. And you bring that in. And so you're going beyond compliance and you're competing. And the third curve is lead, where you are leading in biodiversity conservation. You are the exemplar. People are going to benchmark against you. You will be receiving rewards and recognitions from the government, from the world, from, obviously from your industry. And stakeholders would like to engage with you Partners would like to partner with you. Em potential employees would like to work for you. Talent would like to work for you. You're in a good space. So these are three curves. And you have to do an assessment and find out where are you? Are you in the beginning of the second curve? Are you just at the end of the first curve? Comply, that's it. Nothing more than that. Or are you in the middle of the third curve? which where you're doing some amazing practices and some of them are top notch, but you're still not the exemplar. There's a journey. They say excellence is an unending, unending journey. So there'll be many more uh, curves above that. I'm very fortunate to have worked for an organization which uh, in terms of biodiversity conservation has just some great programs which are considered to be world-class programs. And we have got recognition, not just nationally, but internationally for that. And uh, and uh, I I I'm super annuated. I live in Goa, uh, but so many times I tell the story of those biodiversity conservation to people, and uh, I meet so many people from so many uh, let's say different walks of life who have heard about those projects. So what is the value of that? It is beyond business itself. And I think that is the call that we all need to take. 
of there is business, there is beyond business. There is compliance, there is beyond compliance. And how do we make ourselves the most admired organization in the world, which is caring for the environment, caring for the customers, caring for the people, and yet is profitable. They are not at loggerheads with each other. And they are, there is enough evidence out there to say sustainability makes business sense. So we need to look at it from that perspective. Um, I've covered most of the questions. Just one last one that, uh, you know, you mentioned about uh, companies coming over in areas which may have a lot of biodiversity. Uh, there's one question which says that many companies are operating in industrial areas and, you know, basically not from any sensitive area. So is there some, you know, uh, steps and initiatives that they could take to you know, enhance biodiversity? Okay, good question. Supposing there is a company in an industrial area, uh, maybe it needs some water and you have a water pond. Uh, you can have a water pond which is two feet deep and it's got vertical sides and you're using that water for cooling or whatever else and it's coming from a source. And Now, uh, if you're looking at it from a biodiversity perspective, I'm just giving you one example and there could be hundreds and hundreds of others. I can tell as a biodiversity uh, expert, if you may, I may tell the civil guys that, hey, why don't you just have the first three feet widthwise, widthwise, three feet sloping and then go deep um, rather than start deep from the edge itself. Uh, and I'm not saying make it sloping and shallow all through because then the evaporation loss will be there. So it will impact my operation. Just a little belt, two feet, three feet, where the water is a really little shallow, going deep at a slight angle from zero inches to five inches and then dropping down. And you'll suddenly find that waders will come in to quench the thir thirst. Waders are birds that sit in a little bit of water. And uh, you'll find a lot of biodiversity coming in. They don't like sharp edges. Now someone will say, what is, why do we want to be hosts to birds sitting in our water body but the point is do you not want to be a neighbor of choice not just for people but for biodiversity what is wrong is it impacting your operations if not then you would be considered as an organization that coexists with biodiversity that in a way is creating conditions for biodiversity to thrive without impacting your operations. This is one example. Find out what else you can do, even in the middle of a, uh, what is it called? Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, industrial area or exclusive economic zone or whatever else it is. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dalbar. Uh, so I've covered most of the questions. Uh, just uh, there are many, uh, uh, you know, comments with words of appreciation. Uh, 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 they found the session to be very insightful and information, uh, you know, uh, relevant for banks, businesses. And someone say that we need to work uh, towards conserving biodiversity on a continuous basis and not just restrict it for the D day. Uh, with this. Uh, we may come I, to the may, close of the session. Yeah, please. May I just, may yes. I just uh, mention, and I'll feel guilty if I don't. Um, I want to apologize for uh, the delay that was caused, and I just couldn't solve the technical issue. My laptop had crashed, so I had loaded the operation, operating system again, and uh, I put everybody on on wait, and I sincerely apologize for that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Talwar, for joining us and sharing such an insightful presentation. On behalf of the Fiki Center for Sustainability, I also thank the audience for joining us and being really patient. And, uh, you know, the session being very interactive has helped us, uh, you know, gain many uh, further insights. And uh, in, uh, if you would like to get in touch with Mr. Vivek Talwar, please do write back to us and we'll be happy to connect you with him. Uh, if you have any follow-on questions, uh, we look forward to your presence to our, in our next session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Talwar, once again.
Thank you. Take care. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.